Majera basically builds a straw man argument that NASA and the scientific community at large have been trying to hide the existence of water and moon rocks for 40 years. But occasionally, someone like Dr. Norman slips and exposes the cover-up. This is absurd. Nobody is hiding anything. In fact, Friedman, Gleason, and Hardcastle presented one of the first reports discussing the presence of water and lunar materials at the Apollo 11 Lunar Science Conference in January 1970. And the report was subsequently published in February 1970. It's kind of hard to keep something a secret when you present a report on it at a conference in front of your peers in the press and later publish it. So much for Jarrah's first straw man of the series. If you're interested, you'll find a link to this fascinating report in the sidebar for this video. Webb never reads what's written in the article, which is ironic because it specifically says, The water content in the breccia is 150 to 455 parts per million. And also, Lunar dust contains 810 parts per million H2O. 150 to 810 parts per million is substantially higher than the 50 parts per million that is claimed in the Space.com article. Incidentally, although only 46 parts per million is confirmed in the Space.com article, it also says Alberto, Sal and company estimate that around 260 parts per million is likely to exist in these beads. The highest content of water that Sal and his team estimate that the beads actually contain is 745 parts per million of water, which is comparable to that of their terrestrial counterparts. Webb even quotes this 700 number for terrestrial spherules later on in his video. The truth is that the lunar spherules contain only 40 to 70 parts per million of water compared to about 750 parts per million or more in their terrestrial cousins. This is a big quantitative difference. Correction, 40 to 70 ppm is only the confirmed amount of water. The scientists looking at these beads estimate much, much higher contents, contents that are similar to that of terrestrial glasses. Webb knows this. He had to have read those estimates whilst cherry-picking the plus 700 figure from the Space.com article. If he didn't bother to read the Space.com article, then what about Sal's Nature article that it covered? The opening paragraph of such clearly states, in plain English, Although the pre-eruptive water content of the lunar volcanic glasses cannot be precisely constrained, numerical modeling of diffusive degassing of the very low titanium glasses provides a best estimate of 745 parts per million water, with a minimum of 260 parts per million at the 95% confidence level. And it turns out that even the highest estimates were grossly underestimated. Just days before the completion of this video, YouTube user Frankenstein Money Mac sent me a link to this new science article published on May 26, 2011. In 2008, Alberto Saul of Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island and his colleagues discovered small amounts of water, some 50 parts per million, inside tiny bubbles of volcanic glass collected during the Apollo 15 and 17 missions in the 1960s and 1970s. These rocks formed around 3 billion years ago from the magma ejected by lunar volcanoes, but many scientists were skeptical of the result. Now a new analysis of glass beads from the same sample by many of the same researchers has revealed that the rocks actually contain at least 10 times more water between 615 and 1,410 parts per million. These levels are comparable to the 50 to 1,000 parts per million of water in the Earth's upper mantle. This new science article covers a Science Express paper published that same day, written by a team of scientists that include, surprise surprise, Alberto Sol. I think the new science writers made a typo when they said that the spherules contain at least 10 times more water than previously thought. It is important that we have made these measurements on inclusions from olivine crystals contained within the primitive lunar volcanic glasses. These inclusions were quenched within a matter of minutes after their eruption, providing minimal opportunity for post-eruptive hydrogen diffusion out of the inclusions. And it means that we have a direct H2O measurement on primary lunar magma samples that have not experienced post-eruptive degassing and associated loss of volatiles. 
The water concentrations that we measure are 20 to 100 times higher than the previous direct measurements of the lunar glass beads from this same sample, which was estimated to have suffered a 95 to 98% loss of H2O via degassing, and they are higher than estimates derived from lunar appetite measurements, which require a 95 to 99% correction for fractional crystallization to estimate primary magma volatile contents. Our results are direct measurements on primary lunar magma compositions that require no such extrapolations. How is it a big quantitative difference when the actual content of water for the spherules is considerably higher than even what Sal and others estimated it would be? Estimates that were also comparable to that of terrestrial water. And either way, these numbers are clearly much higher than even the smallest amount of water that scientists could detect prior to the invention of Sal's secondary ion mass spectrometry. Tell me, Webb, if you and your propagandist buddies are not trying to hide the presence of water in the Apollo samples, why do you routinely claim that it is in much smaller quantities than what your own fascinating sources tell you? Webb evidently pulls this tactic again when on the subject of water in the non-glass samples. Towards the end of his video, Webb claims that the total percentage of water by weight in the lunar rocks was less than one hundredth of a percent, which works out to be less than one hundred parts per million. The trace water detected in the lunar basalts when they first arrived on Earth amounts to less than one hundredth of a percent by weight compared to two-tenths to one percent by weight for their terrestrial cousins. Another big quantitative difference. This is clearly wrong. As we saw earlier, the first content of water detected in the lunar samples was as high as 810 parts per million, which is close to 0.1 percent by weight. Half the minimum amount of water that Webb claims is detected in terrestrial rocks. Actually, even the lower end of the range that Webb applies to terrestrial basalts is in doubt, because on page 1105 of their report, Friedman and his team explicitly state, It is interesting to note that the water content of the breccias is about equal to that found for freshly erupted Hawaiian basalt. So it seems, at the lowest, terrestrial basalts contain around 150 parts per million to 455 parts per million. I have no reason to question the higher end of the range that Webb cited. I have seen this 10,000 figure referenced in various other places, such as in this article by NASA's John O'Keefe. So once again, we have spherules with estimated water contents that are commensurate to their terrestrial cousins, and rock and soil samples with water within the same range as their terrestrial cousins. Webb knew these samples had the same amount of water as their terrestrial cousins? He had to. He had the fascinating report and omitted its info that was staring him right in the face. Even the front page you flashes on screen puts numbers that are quite clearly more than one hundredth of one percent by weight. Webb kept this front page on screen long enough for anyone to read it without even pausing the video. Yet, none of his adoring fans have picked up on this big quantitative number. In fact, I'm surprised Webb even posted a link to Friedman's report. Anyone can just click on it and see the actual numbers and how they compare to those in Earthrox. Incredibly, judging by their gloating and congratulating comments, it seems none of Webb's adoring fans have even bothered to do something as simple as checking the link. Do any of these propagandists even watch these videos? Or do they just blindly pat each other on the back and hope whatever mud they throw will stick? Why in one circumstance claim the highest amount of water that could ever be found in moon rocks prior to 2008 was around 50 to 70 parts per million and always less than 100 parts per million? And yet, in another circumstance, show a document that states that the lunar water is 455 ppm for the actual rocks and 810 ppm for the lunar dust, and that these numbers are equal to that of their terrestrial cousins. By claiming the highest amount of water was 50 parts per million, Webb can use that number to try and downplay the quantity of water found in the rocks. But by showing a document that puts the number much higher than 50, but was published much earlier, he can use this as part of his response to the straw man version of my argument he's created. 
Evidently, Phil Webb simply cherry-picks whichever source is convenient to his argument at any given point in time, even if it contradicts something he said earlier. Other geologists in 1970 reported even higher water concentrations than what was reported in Webb's source. This article by Friedman and Company was published in the January 1970 issue of Science Magazine, appropriately titled The Moon Issue, as it featured many, many reports on Apollo samples, lunar laser ranging, and various other Apollo experiments. Printed in this same issue is another article by S.O. Agrell and Friends from the Department of Mineralogy and Petrology at the University of Cambridge. Their article is titled, Mineralogy and Petrology of Some Lunar Samples. And in it, we are told that the four samples they studied all contain water. The lowest H2O content they found was 0.05% by weight, or 500 parts per million. This is along the same lines as what Friedman found in sample 11046. But the other three rocks contained contents as high as 0.1% by weight to 0.15% by weight. This works out to be 1,000 parts per million and 1,500 parts per million. This not only exceeds what Friedman detected in the soil samples, it is also only slightly less than the lowest water content for terrestrial rocks. Or should I say, the lower amount of water that Webb applies to terrestrial samples. Taking into consideration the 150 parts per million figure that Friedman's fascinating report applies to freshly erupted basalts, this 1500 number is well above the actual lower end of the range for water in terrestrial rocks. Agrell also reported on finding ferric iron in one of his samples, albeit trace amounts, something that Webb claims is totally absent in Apollo samples. Now that we are all agreed on how substantial the water in the Apollo samples is, I'd like to take this opportunity to make a quick reply to Astro Grant 2's dodging of my 32 questions. As was the case with the topic of radiation, Astro Brandt 2 dodged his whole way through my two questions regarding lunar water.